Hello everyone. Welcome you all again, once again. In our earlier class, we talked about the evolutionary process of sporophyte evolution in bryophytes. So in our today's class, we shall be discussing about the very primitive genus within the bryophytes, that is Rixia in the process of evolution of sporophyte. So let us start about the topic Rixia. Now, as we all know that Rixia, it belongs to the family Rixiaceae under the order Marcantiales and the class is Hepaticopsida. That is what is about the systematic position of this genus Rixia. Now, regarding their distribution, Rixia, it is a cosmopolitan in distribution, that is, it is widely distributed in both tropical as well as the temperate regions of the world and it is represented by about 138 different species under the single genus Rixia. Now, all the species under this genus Rixia, they are terrestrial, that means they grow on soil. However, they need a moist condition to grow on soil and they also grow on rocks. There is an exception, however, the particular species called Rixia fluitans. It is an aquatic species and it is found to be free floating in the water bodies of lakes and ponds. Now let us see about or let us discuss about the gametophytic phase or their external morphology of the plant body of Rixia. So as you can see here in this diagram, figure 1, 2, 3 and 4, the Rixia, it appears different in their external morphology. But in most of these cases, we can see that the plant body is a uh, thalloid. It is not uh, leafy, it is thalloid and it is fleshy and also it is prostrate. Dorsi ventrally it is flattened and it shows a wedge shaped structure due to this dichotomous branching. So, as a result of this dichotomous branching, the shape or the external morphology of the rixia it differs from one another. Like in this first case, it is called the rosette habit. Now, this rosette habit, it results from the repeated dichotomous branching of the rixia thallus. There is another form of external morphology available. This is called the cruciate form or it looks like the X-like structure that is why the name cruciate form and it is seen in case of the particular species called Rixia cruciata and it is the result of two dichotomous branching of the Rixia thallus. So depending upon the dichotomous branching, the Rixia thallus can be of rosette-like or it may be of cruciate form. Now let us move on to the anatomy of the Rixia plant body. The thallus internally, it is differentiated into two different regions. Number one, upper assimilatory region and lower storage region. Now why it is called the uppermost layer, why it is called assimilatory? This is because it contains chlorophyll in their cells and that is responsible for the process of photosynthesis in the plant body of the Rixia thallus. And that is why this is known as the upper assimilatory region. And the lower region, it acts as a storage device for this particular plant and it stores stars as a reserve food material. And that is why this region is known as the lower storage region. Now let us discuss these two regions one by one. First, upper assimilatory region. As I have already uh, mentioned that this particular region, it is very rich in chloroplast. The cells contain chlorophyll cells and these cells are stacked over one another in such a way that it forms a filament-like structure. And these filaments, they serve as the column of air chamber and air pores are also present. But the uppermost cells of this assimilatory filaments, they do not contain the chloroplasts. 
and that is why they together form a loose epidermis for the plant body of rickshia. Now, these filaments which serve as an air chamber, the function of this air chamber is to open on the dorsal surface of the plant body of rickshia by an air pore and it helps in the process of gaseous actions in the plant body of rickshia. So this is a diagram which shows it is a vertical cross section of the rickshia talus showing the different parts. So in this diagram you can clearly see these two particular regions. This uppermost region, these are the filaments. So this is called the upper assimilatory region and this lowermost part is called the lower storage region. So this uppermost part, these dotted structures, this indicates that these cells are very rich in chloroplast and that is why they are assimilatory that means they can photosynthesize and they can produce the necessary food materials so these are the chloroplast containing cells which are shown in dotted, dotted form and this uppermost epidermal cell you can see here these are not dotted this line of cell these are not dotted the uppermost cell they are uh, lacking chloroplast and that is why they form this loose epidermal layer in the plant body of rickshia. Now, in between these filaments, there is present this air chamber which helps in the gaseous accents. You can see here, this is the archegonia which is the female sex organ which is produced in the thalas of rickshia and it is embedded within the thalas. And below this upper assimilatory region, this lowermost part, this is called the lower storage region. Now this lower storage region, it is made up of thin walled non-chlorophylla cells. So there is no dotted structures uh, seen in this particular region because these cells do not contain any chloroplast and they serve as the reservoir and they store the reserve food material that is the stars which is produced by this assimilatory region. Now this outermost or this lowermost layer it is called the lower epidermis. There is an upper epidermal tissue and there is a lower epidermis as well. Now on this lower epidermis you can see here these are the different outgrowths which are called the appendages which are present in the plant body of uh, uh, rickshia. Now these appendages are again of two types. The first type is called the rhizoid and the second type is called the scale. Now rhizoids they are again of two types as you can see here. Some are smooth walled rhizoids and some are tuberculated rhizoids. So whether they are smooth walled or they are tuberculated, the function of these rhizoids is to help in the process of anchorage to the substratum. And that is how it grows on soil, moist soil or on rock surfaces. And the function of this scale is that it performs as a conducting tissue and it uh, carries water to the cells of the uh, talus of rickshia. So this is about these two different reasons anatomically the upper assimilatory region and the lower storage region which is seen in the plant body of rickshia and the sex organs whether it is antheridium that is the male one or the archegonium that is the female one they are always present embedded within the talus of the rickshia. Now next let's move on to the reproduction how it reproduces. It has been seen that there are two different methods by which the rickshia plant reproduces, vegetative and sexual. So vegetative method, they use vegetative method of reproduction when the environmental conditions are very, very favorable for germination. Otherwise, they, they, they will go for sexual. So let us see what are the different vegetative methods of reproduction available in rickshia. So there are different methods like by death and decay of the older portion of the thallus. When the plant grows old, the older portions get uh, uh, becomes dead and then it gets decayed. And now from that dead and decay portion, again new plant body can be regenerated. 
Then there is another method called by the formation of adventitious branches, which are developed on the ventral surface of the thallus in some species. And after separation or after fragmentation, these adventitious branches can again develop into new plant body or new thallus. Then by the method called persistent apices. So persistent apices means when the environmental condition is very, very unfavorable, then the whole plant body, it may dry up. It dries up. And in that situation, only the apex or the tip portion of the plant, it survives. And it, when the environmental condition again becomes favorable, then that persistent apex, it can regenerate and can develop into a new thallus. So that is what this method is called by producing persistent apices in Rixia. Then by the formation of tubers, it has been seen that at the apical portion of the thallus, some tuber-like structures are also produced when the conditions are very, very unfavorable. So these tubers can, uh, pro uh, they, they can withstand this unfavorable, prolonged unfavorable condition. And when the conditions become again favorable, they can germinate and can give rise to a new thallus. Then by rhizoids also. The young rhizoids, they divide and redivide to form a gamma-like structure, which is the gamma is a particular structure, vegetative, which is found in case of Mercantia. But in case of Rixia also, sometimes this gamma-like mass of cells may develop and these cells are capable of growing into a new plant in case of Rixia. So this is a diagram which shows how by death and decay of older portion, how by fragmentation, new tele which is a plural form of thallus, can regenerate it, can be produced. These are the tubers, how it is produced and how after the detachment or fragmentation from the plant body, these tubers can regenerate into a new plant body. And these are the adventitious branches which are produced at the ventral surface of the rickshaw thallus and after fragmentation or separation from the main parent body, they can again regenerate into a new plant uh, of rexia. So these are the different methods of vegetative reproduction found in case of the genus called rexia. Now let us move on to the second method that is sexual reproduction. So sexual method of reproduction it is called the ugema type. Probably you have heard about this term ugemas which is also found in some algae ugemas type of reproduction. So they may be homothallic or heterothallic depending on the sex organs that is the antridium and archegonia that is the male and female one whether they are born on a single plant or on different plant body. So depending on that they may be homothallic or they may be heterothallic. However, whether they are homothallic or they are heterothallic the sex organs that is antridium and archegonium in case of rickshia they are always embedded within the thallus. That is a very peculiar character in case of Rixia. This is a diagram which shows the structure of the male sex organ that is the antridium and the female sex organ that is the archegonium in case of Rixia. So the male sex organ or this antridium it has a stalk. It has this androcyte mother cells which are produced within a wall called antridial wall. This is the antradial chamber and this is the opening of the antradial chamber known as a osteole. Through this osteole or this opening, this androcyte mother cells, it will produce the sperms which will get liberated. So as to reach this female sex organ called the archegonium. Now this archegonium, this is the center of this or the central cavity of the archegonium which is called the egg cell. This egg cell, just above this egg cell, there is a ventral canal cell then there are neck canal cells and this neck canal cell, ventral canal cell and this egg cell, it is well protected by a covering of made up of ventral wall, neck canal, neck cells and this is the ventral cavity within which the egg cell is produced in case of rexia. Then when this uh, antridium and this archegonium, when it will mature enough, then the male gamete, it will unite with the female gamete and this process we all know it is known as the fertilization. So in case of rickshia also at the end of the sexual reproduction, 
uh, the maturity of these sex organs, fertilization will take place. And as a result of fertilization, a zygote, which is a diploid one, it is produced. It is also known as the oospore or the diploid zygote. And the most important point is what? That it needs water to complete this process of fertilization or sexual reproduction. Now, this diploid zygote or the oospore that is produced as a result of fertilization in rixia, it represents the first cell of the sporophytic generation. This oospore then enlarges until and unless it fills the whole venter of the archegodium and then it will secrete a cell wall around the oospore and the oospore will again undergo repeated divisions to form a two-layered calyptra which will surround the developing sporophyte also known as the sporogonium. So this is the structure of the sporogonium the trees of the thallus passing through the sporogonium. This is the sporogonium in case of rixia. And as I have already mentioned, the sex organs are always embedded within the thallus. So the sporogonium will also be produced within the thallus. So this is the upper assimilatory region. This is the lower storage region. And this is the archegonium, which after fertilization has produced this sporogonium or the uh, sporophyte. Now this sporogonium it has this outermost layer called the calyptra and within this sporogonium it includes these spores which are produced as a result of reduction division or meiosis of the spore mother cells. That is why these spores are also known as neospores. Now the let us see the spore dispersal mechanism or the dehiscence mechanism of the sporogonium. In case of bryophytes, the spore dispersal mechanisms are quite diverse, but the very interesting feature which is associated with this particular genus Rixia is that it never dehisces. There is no dehiscence mechanism in the sporogonium of Rixia. So how the spores will be liberated? The spores are liberated by decay of the surrounding tissue. The surrounding talus, it will decay, which will ultimately liberate the mature spores. So after liberation, which will the spores, they will germinate under favorable conditions to form a new thallus of rixia and it will continue in this way, the life cycle of rixia, it will continue. So evolutionary significance, in our first class, we have already mentioned about what are the various evolutionary significance. So according to the theory of progressive sterilization uh, in the process of evolution of sporophyte of um, in, among in bryophytes, rixia represents the first stage in the process of this evolution. So in this case of because in case of rixia, this sporogonium, it doesn't have the sterile structures like foot and seta. It only includes the capsule and the capsule, uh, the jacket layer or the calyptra within which only the fertile mass of tissues are present. And according to this evolutionary process, the complex sporophytes of funeria or sphagnum, they have developed from this rixia species or rixia sporophyte. So this is the overall life cycle of rixia. The sporophytic phase and the gametophytic phase, there is a distinct alteration between these two phases. And the zygote represents the first cell of the sporophytic phase and the spore they represents the first cell of the gametophytic phase. So this is all about this genus rixia in today's, for today's class. So that is all about. Thank you for watching. If you think this material is helpful, helpful for you, then please like and subscribe. Thank you.